want to tell you a story about how I saved my son's life. And a lot of you are probably like, what, only once? Because I'm sure many of you parents have had many stories like the one I'm going to share with you. Right. And so the other day, I was in the kitchen. Nothing to do with knives, okay? I was in the kitchen. <laughs> and, my, uh, and my son, he says to me, he says, Dad, you saved my life. It's kind of out of the blue. And I said, I said, what do you mean? And he said, one time we were in a pool and I, I had a flotation device and I, and I let go of it and I was sinking into the water. And he was three, you know, two or three years old, he couldn't, he couldn't swim. He said, you swam over to me and you pulled me out of the water. You saved my life. And, um, and I was thinking about that and I was thinking about this, this sermon actually, because the message we're talking about today is how we can be confident in our standing with God. If you think about my son at the time, there's no way that he could have any confidence in himself to save himself. He couldn't have pulled himself out of that water on his own. He needed rescuing. And a lot, a lot of people in this world today, unfortunately, put our confidence in ourselves. We think that we can be good enough to have a good standing before God. Sometimes we put confidence in other things, such as maybe our heritage. Maybe you have a godly family member, a godly parent. We put the confidence in them. We say, I'm okay with God. But these two things particularly are the things that Paul's bringing up in this passage today, where he's saying these things that you might have confidence in, there's no place to put your confidence there. You can only have your confidence in Christ. That is the only place that you can put it. So, uh, Romans 2, 17 through 29 is what we're covering today. And this, this message, by the way, is for the believer, not just the unbeliever. Many people have, have our confidence uh, shaken. We have no confidence. But I want to tell you, Christian friend, you can be confident in the Lord. You can be confident in your standing before Christ. And I think a lot of people in this world maybe might say, wow, Tim, that's pretty arrogant of you to say. But it's, it's not arrogant because it's not based on me. Right? It's based on Christ. Okay? All right. Romans 2. Before we hop in, I want to give you, like, let's step back. I know everyone's eyes are glazing over right now. But just step back and look at the, the uh, broad picture of where we are in Romans, okay? Romans uh, is a letter, okay? And I, I know you know this, but we, we read Romans a couple of verses at a time, and we study it together, as we should. But it's a letter, and originally it was written, read, all at once, from 1-1 one, one all the way through, Okay? So we need to remember the context of what Paul is talking about as we talk about the section we're talking about today. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're still in the first section, right? Introduction, section one, is Paul is talking about sin and how we are all under sin. A few weeks ago, Jim and Jonathan talked about how the Gentile world is under sin. And it was pretty self-evident. He's just, look at them. They're pretty depraved, right? That was the message. But he's looking at the Jews and the Jewish world is different, right? They had prophets, they had the law, you know, they had the Bible, they had God. And the, these people looked like moral people. If you look at them, you'd say, that's somebody that I can trust. They're not cheating, they're not stealing, right? Maybe you'll let your kids watch them, right? They're the kind of people that you can trust. But Paul's saying, you as well need God's grace, okay? So ultimately, we're going here. This is, you know, not my message, but ultimately here. The whole world is guilty before God, whether you're Jew or you're Gentile, okay? All right. But today, we're talking about the Jewish world. My clicker does not seem to work. I will turn it on again. See if that works. All right, what's going on, Chris? Okay. Here's my outline for the day. Um, Again, you can be confident before God. And here's the three points, right? You can't trust in your good works. You can't trust it in your godly heritage. But you can trust in Christ. Okay? All right, let's read together. Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 29. So I'll read the whole thing, and then we'll dive in. Let's read it on the screen. But if you bear the name Jew, and rely upon the law, and boast in God, and know his will, and approve the things that are essential, 
being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of truth. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one should not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law through your breaking of the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. For indeed, circumcision is of value if you practice the law, but if you're a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And he who is physically uncircumcised, but he keeps the law, will he not judge you, who though having the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? But he's not a Jew who's one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who's one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, not the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. Okay, let's dive into this. So you can't trust in good works, verses 17 through 24. The first thing that Paul points out, though, interestingly, is the law is good. I think a lot of times um, in, in our church, in churches like ours, we focus so much on the new covenant, right? We, and, it, and it's true. Paul says the new, well, in, in Hebrews, it says the new covenant is better, right? But the law is good. The law is good. And Paul spends a lot of time actually praising the law in these verses. Let's highlight this for you, okay? In, ver in the green, you see three, where, three places. He calls the law God's will. He says that it is instructed, being instructed out of the law, so instruction for life is found in the law. Embodiment of knowledge and truth. Can you get higher praise than that? The embodiment of knowledge and of truth. This is what Paul calls the law. So let's go through these, right? Know God's will. Do you want to know God's will? Most people would say they do, but they want to know God's will. Apparently, you should study the law. Next, instruction for life. And he uses these phrases, a guide, a light, a corrector, a teacher. So much of what we believe is right and wrong is found in the Bible. It's found in the, in the Old Testament law. So much of it. We're like, we're like fish in the water. We don't realize we're wet. In our culture, we... We swim in this. What we believe is right and wrong comes straight from the Bible. But we don't even realize it. But that's, that's the fact. Okay? Then, it talks about the embodiment of knowledge and of truth. So the Apostle Paul loves the law. And in fact, um, it, reading this, it reminded me of our study in the Psalms, where so much of it, right, Psalm 119, um, talks about how almost every single verse talks about how I love your law meditate on it day and night. Um, it is the embodiment of knowledge and truth. But, so the law is good. The problem is you, not so much. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but nobody can live up to the standard of the law. Because the standard is perfection. It's absolute perfection. And every single one of us falls short. That's the problem, right? So these people are putting their trust in themselves and in the law, but they can't live up to it. That's where they are. Paul says this. He says, you therefore who teach another, do you teach yourself? You who preach, do not steal, do you steal? You say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? He's pointing the finger back at them. He mentions four things here, but he could have kept going. Right, we fall so short of if even our own standards, much less God's standards. It says, let's go through these four things one at a time. Hypocrisy. It says, do you teach yourself? Do we hold other people to standards that we don't hold to ourselves? I think a lot of times that happens in relationships between spouses. Or relationships between parents and kids. Or grown, parent, or grown kids and their parents. 
we hold people to standards that we can't, that we ex expect things of them that we don't expect of ourselves. We want them to be perfect, but that we want them to show us grace. Is that fair? The other thing is hypocrisy is, is literally stage acting, right? Putting on a play. Have you noticed that a lot of places that you go, people are always wearing a front? Have you noticed that? I, I used to work from the office, and thank God I get to work from home now. I love working from home. But I used to go into the office, and I kid you not, like everybody, it seems like they're all, everyone always just has a face. You have to pretend to be better than you are, like always be your best self, always present something about yourself. And that's something that I think people can fall in the trap of doing in their daily lives. They're always trying to present their best self. And, it, and even coming to church like this, you might present your best self. You're trying to present yourself as something that you're not. Don't do that. We need to be honest with, with ourselves before God, who we really are. It takes some humility. Take down the mask. Don't have hypocrisy. Next, stealing. Do you steal? Tomorrow's tax day. <laughs> so um, I was thinking through this, right, stealing. And, and um, I think sometimes there are things like, you know, like, when's the last time you robbed a bank? Of course, no one here is going to raise their hand. But when it comes to stealing, I think sometimes there are things that we may, uh, there may be gray areas that we say, well, you know, but I think that we need to have a higher standard. Right, for example, I, when I was in my early 20s, I used to work at a coffee shop as a barista. And there were people, there was this guy that I worked with, he used to give away free drinks to certain people. And there's no way really to, for the you know, management to tell that's going on as how do you measure volume, right? And so he, might, he could get away with it, right? And I didn't think of it too much at the time, but looking back on it, you realize that's stealing. Unless he had express permission from the owner, he can give this away. It's, he does not, doesn't have the right to do that. And the person receiving it is also stealing because they're taking something that's stolen for themselves. And sometimes, you know, like I, growing up, I, I, you know, had my rough edges and I think to myself, you know, oh, that's just, you know, fucking up your body, right? No, it's stealing. Is there anything in your life that you're okay with that you shouldn't be okay with? When it comes to stealing? Next, adultery. Now, I hope that no one in this room is committing adultery. Something that I recognize that when it comes to adultery is that, is that this culture just pushes so hard against marriage, and, it, and we have to fight for our marriages. You recognize that? We also have to fight for our kids. I mean, this is so tame, but my family, we watch National Treasure, right? And if you watch National Treasure, like, is there anything objectionable in that movie? Um, but then we, watch, then we watch number two, and my, and my son goes, oh, I thought they got married because they moved in together at the end of the movie. It's like, well, son, let me tell you about what's going on. You know, Disney is trying to push fornication on you, right? We have to have these discussions with our kids if we let them watch these movies, because this is not godly. And that is a tame example. What are you OK with? What goes on on your screens? This culture is trying to make you not like God. It's trying to change you to not be like him. And we have to fight to be like him and lead our families as well. Okay? Next, idolatry. Do you rob temples? Anyone here rob temples? <laughs> you know, I was thinking about this, right? But obviously, idolatry, the New Testament teaches us that Idols, there are idols in our hearts, right? It's not just the physical idols that people, you know, at your Chinese restaurant or something, right? It's, it's not just those, but there's idols in our hearts, right? So what are the idols that this culture lifts up? What are the idols that are there? There are lots of them, lots of idols. And one thing that came to my mind when I was thinking about this was, 
education. I don't know how many of you succumb to this, but I've known people who go to college and they desire so much the approval of their professors and of people that they view as smart and they want essentially the approval of the world. So they essentially compromise on God's word. And I know people who are not walking with the Lord today because of those compromises that they made. Let me tell you something. The world's never going to approve of you if you're following Jesus. And you have to understand that and you have to get over it. At some point, you have to make that decision. Am I going to follow the Lord? Or do I want approval of the world? And that's one example. There are lots of examples. Here's another one for you. You know, I think a lot of us are glued to these things. Good or bad, you know? You could be consuming good content. Good content. But I mean, let's say, you know, you're surrounded by your family and you're like this. Is that a good thing? One thing I try to do personally is after work, uh, I leave my phone on my counter in the kitchen. So I'll be in the living room, hang out with my family, and I leave the, count, like, the phone in the kitchen. And it's just like when I grew up in the 90s, right? People had phones, but they weren't just staring at them all day, right? They had the phones, they were in the kitchen. And so when someone called, you could go answer the phone, right? But it's not consuming your life, right? Okay. Next. All right. It says, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. That is a harsh statement. Is the name of God blasphemed because of you? You realize you recognize, you, you represent Christ everywhere you go if you're a Christian. You represent Christ everywhere you go. And I have to tell you, I have, bla- I have had, caused people to blaspheme Christ because of me. It's true. And I'm, anyways, I'll tell you, I'll t- let me tell you the story. When I was in college, I was, in, I was president of campus ministry. I was trying to get people to be saved. I was at the table, we'd evangelize. We wanted to see people saved. And there was a class that I was taking, and there's this guy in the class that I was trying to minister to. And, um, and one day, uh, I'll tell you, I was struggling with this class. And one day, he, uh, he says to me and a couple of the people we were sitting with, he's like, maybe we should help each other out on this next test. Cheat, right? He says, maybe we should cheat. And I didn't say anything at, the, at that moment, but I ended up succumbing to that temptation. I cheated. And looking back on it, I think, did he, was he testing me? And did I fail that test? Was the name of God blasphemed because of me, the representative of Jesus? How about you? Is the name of God blasphemed because of you? Are you the same at work or at school as you are here? Are you okay with those jokes you shouldn't be okay with? Okay, pop quiz. It says, just as it, was, just as it is written. Where is this found in the Old Testament? Does anybody know? Anybody at all? Anybody? No guesses? Come on, somebody. David and Bathsheba. Very good. Very good. This is exactly, it's talking about David and Bathsheba. Okay, and you guys know the story. David, Bathsheba, and Uriah, all that. So David commits this sin. He has adultery with Bathsheba, and he has Bathsheba's husband murdered, okay? And he takes her as his own wife. And then, um, and then a year later, he's pretending everything is fine. And a year later, Nathan the prophet comes to him. And you know the story. He tells him the story. David is, and he tells him this. He says, the name of God is blasphemy among the Gentiles. Who was David? This is the man after God's own heart. This is the man that, that God told Samuel. He said, man looks, at the outward, uh, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. He's talking about David. 
And David committed a sin that caused people to blaspheme God's name. You know, it's interesting. Literarily, the Apostle Paul uh, ties this back together in chapter 4. He weaves this back in. Because even in chapter 2, uh, sorry, even in the Old Testament, salvation was by faith, by grace through faith, just like it is today. Okay? So he ties it back in, uh, quoting from Psalm 32, in which a psalm that David wrote after this took place, when he was confronted by his sin. And he says this, I'm going to show it to you. He says, how blessed. You guys know what the word blessed means? Happy. The word blessed means happy. How blessed are though is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And this is the section of scripture that the Apostle Paul quotes in chapter 4 to show that even in the Old Testament, it wasn't based on how good you were, how good you can follow God's law. It was based on God's grace and his forgiveness to those who are willing to admit their sins and come to him. And I want to show you this psalm. It's so amazing. He says, when I kept quiet about my sin, my body wasted away through groaning all day long. Have you felt that way? I have. When you sin, you try to keep it inside, it just shatters your body. So day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. He says, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. I mean, even just reading this right now makes a weight lift off. God's forgiveness is amazing. Confession brings freedom. When you confess your sin to the Lord, you can be free. And the interesting thing is, that he says, I did not hide. Now think about this, you know? You ever played hide and seek with the one and a half year olds? You know where they live, you know where they're hiding. You can't hide from God. Don't hide your sin. You can't hide. You can't hide anyways. He knows. Don't hide. Okay. He says, therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when he may be found. Surely a great, in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. He says, when he may be found. There's a story that Jesus tells where he says there are ten women who are invited to a wedding feast. And five get there on time. And they're invited in. They have a great time. And if I were late, the door's already closed. It's too late. They can't come in. And right now, we live in the age of grace. And the, and the offer of salvation is freely offered to anyone who will accept it. But one day, that offer will not be there anymore. And he says, come when you, may be, when, when you may be found. Last slide for Psalm 32. It says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you, you will go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near to you. Interestingly, verse 9, he's saying, God's not going to treat you like a dumb animal. He's not going to put a bit in your mouth and make you go where you don't want to go. But he's calling you to come to him. And in verse 10 is the sales pitch. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness, trusts around him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. So the offer is, hey, do you want to be sorrowful? Do you want a life of sorrows and wickedness? Or do you want a life of joy in the Lord? Those are your choices. You older folks in the back, amen? Amen? You've lived a full life. Is this true? Venture, is this true? Amen. It's true. It's true. I'm not making this up. This is true. Okay? All right. Next. Okay, so you can't, 
trust in your good works, you're never going to be good enough, okay? You can't trust in your godly heritage. We'll, we'll, go, we'll go through this one at a time, okay? So circumcision, what is circumcision? It's a sign of God's covenant with Abraham. Now let's look at this in, in Genesis 17. I highlighted this for you in, in yellow. It's who's the covenant between, and in green is what is the covenant, okay? So it's clear to see. God made a covenant with Abraham. And he said, I will establish my covenant between me and you, okay? And what is the covenant? I will multiply you exceedingly. It says, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you. You will be a father of a multitude of nations. So what is the covenant? He's going to make you a father of a multitude of nations. Now right now, Abraham, Isaac was not even born yet. Abraham is 99 years old. Isaac's not born. And he says, guess what? I'm going to multiply you like the sand of the sea. Okay? That's the first thing. The second thing, he says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you. So it's not just between God and Abraham. This sand of the sea descendants, he's going to establish with them as well. Okay? And what is his covenant? This is to be God to you and to your descendants after you. And I will give you and your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So his, his promise is, I will multiply you, I will give you the land of Canaan, and I will be your God. Okay? That's the covenant. And a covenant is a binding contract, a binding agreement. And what does Abraham have to do? He says, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout their generations, and this is my covenant. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Okay? So this is what, the, this is what circumcision is about. This is all the, the hoopla about circumcision comes back to here, okay? God tells Abraham and his descendants to be circumcised, okay? Every male among you shall be circumcised throughout your generations. So when Paul writes this letter in Romans chapter 2 to this group of believers, this section of them, they are Jews. They are descendants of Abraham, and they are circumcised. And so they can sit back and say, listen, Paul, I have nothing to worry about because God said he's going to be my God, I'm part of this covenant already, right? Um, and I, I've been circumcised. I've born of Abraham. I'm good to go. That could be the argument that they make, right? But Paul says this. <sighs> he says, if you transgress the law, circumcision is of no value to you. And Paul didn't just make this up, okay? Here's the verse. If you transgress the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcised. He says, didn't we just establish that everyone transgresses the law? So if everyone transgresses the law, then it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or not. It's of no value to you. Okay? So your, your, your background, your godly heritage, some people put it, their faith in their godly heritage, right? My grandma brought me to church. My parents bring me to church. It doesn't matter. You have to have faith yourself. It's not based on someone else. Does that make sense? This is not new. Paul didn't come in and say, hey, I'm an apostle, so I'm going to make up new stuff. Okay? He quotes this from Jeremiah 9. Not quotes, but he alludes to it strongly. And you see it, right? It says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will punish all who are circumcised yet uncircumcised. How is that possible? How can you be both circumcised and uncircumcised? That makes no sense. He lists Judah with the, with the Gentile nations. And he says, all the nations are uncircumcised, and the house of Israel are uncircumcised of heart. So he tells them right there, Jeremiah, a thousand years before Paul, says, you can be both circumcised and uncircumcised at the same time. Because you're a descendant of Abraham, great. You followed the covenant, fine. But your hearts are not with you. You are not circumcised in your heart. And this is what Paul's alluding to in chapter 2 of, of Romans. And then Paul says to you know, further, he's, a Jew, he's not a Jew who's one outwardly. And the verse says, he's not a Jew who's one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he's a Jew who's one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, Paul had to learn this personally. 
Because the Apostle Paul, right, he had everything. He was born into the right situation. He had the right parents. He had the right family line. He, he had people that his parents set him up for success. They trained him the way he should go. They circumcised him on the eighth day. And then he did everything right. He followed the law. He became a Pharisee. He did everything he's supposed to do. He spells this out in, Roman, in Philippians chapter, th chapter 3. But what does he say? He says, those things were counted that were gains to me, these things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He had to recognize that all the goodness that he had, he had to lay it aside because it wasn't good enough. And he had to grab a hold of what Christ had for him and take that for himself. And that was the only way that he could be confident in his position before God. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So finally, you can trust in Christ. So you can't trust in your good works, you can't trust in your godly heritage, but you can trust in Christ. This is what it says. It says we all need to be circumcised in the heart. All of us. The verse, I just read it, so I'm going to read it again. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter, that is the law. And his praise is not from men, but from God. Okay? So here's some things I want to, points I want to make, okay? If you read it, it could sound like Christians and Jews are the same thing. But that's not, that's not the point Paul's making here. The point Paul's making here is he's writing to Jews about Jews, okay? So he says, you're not a real Jew if you're not circumcised. Read Jeremiah 9, okay? That's the point he's making. Next, um, you don't get any points for having a godly heritage. This is something my dad used to tell me when I was growing up. He used to say, God doesn't have grandchildren. He only has children. I don't know if you guys have heard that before. God doesn't have grandchildren. That means you're not born into it. But his faith can't save me. My mom's faith can't save me. I mean, I'm blessed to have godly parents and grandparents. I mean, I come from a godly heritage. But that's not good enough. Their faith cannot save me. Right? So you don't get any points for having a godly heritage. Circumcision is of the heart by the spirit. And there's some points I want to make, because there's some parallels between the circumcision and the circumcision of the heart. I, I put them here. First of all, circumcision is, a, is being marked out as God's. You're set apart. When you are circumcised, you're set apart. You are, you are marked out as God's. Like John was saying earlier, right? Be holy as I am holy. You are marked out as God's when you're, when you're circumcised. And then there's a point in time, right? You're not, you're not born into it, right? You don't just kind of wander into it. You don't just start going to church and then you kind of are, kind of aren't, right? There has to be a point in time where you say, well, yesterday I was not and today I am. Yesterday I was on a path toward destruction but today I'm on a path towards righteousness. Right, that's to be a point in time in your life. Next, you can't do it yourself. Right, it's not something that you can do yourself. It's something that only has to be done for you, done to you. And, it, and Paul tells us in Romans that it's something that only the Spirit of God can do for you. And finally, there's no reversing it. Once you are, once you are circumcised, you can't get uncircumcised. And once you are saved, you cannot be unsaved. It's, it's for eternity. He has you in his hands forever. And this is, this is the beauty of it. Once you put your faith and trust in Christ, right, many people struggle with their confidence in, in, in who they are in the Lord, right? And, and we struggle because I think we don't fully understand that we have nothing to do with it. Just like Jude couldn't save himself, right? Christ saves you, and you are secure in his hands. Does that make sense? And once you're saved, he will hold you and he will never let you go. You don't have to worry. Finally, you know, this is, well, not finally, but next, this is not new. This is something that Moses preaches in Deuteronomy. All right, I'll just show you one of these verses. He says this. This is Moses. He's, they're about to go into the promised land and he's preaching to the people he's been watching for so long. He says, behold, to the Lord... Your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, earth and all that is in it. Yet on your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
did the Lord set his affection to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, even you above all the peoples, as it is this day. So circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. Stiffen your neck is to fight against God. So stop fighting and let God do his work. Again, that's the call that Moses, this is from Moses 3,000 years ago. He's calling the same thing that the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 2. Skip that one. Okay. Finally, this is accomplished in Jesus. Okay. Colossians 2, we see this, where this is finally accomplished in Jesus. It says, in him, that is Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Some people ask, where does it say that Jesus is God? Well, among other places, right here, okay? Jesus is God in the flesh. That's what it says right there, verse 9. It says, and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority, and in him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who, is, who has raised him from the dead. Now again, this is written, Colossians written to believers. And he's saying, you have been circumcised. Your heart has been circumcised. You have been died with Christ, and now you've raised with Christ. This is when you were dead in your, in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And ultimately, right, Jesus took our debt of sin on himself. It says he nailed it to the cross. What a beautiful image. He took the certificate of debt and nailed it to the cross, the debt that we couldn't pay. And ultimately, you know, this is written to believers saying he took it and he paid it for you. And if you're not a believer today, but you have an option right now, you have an option. You, you can either take that debt and say, you know what? I'll pay that debt on judgment day. I'll go to the, judgment, the, the great white throne of judgment and I'll give my debt to God and say, God, I will take eternity paying off this debt. Or you can let Christ take your debt and nail it to the cross and you can be free. My friends, it's a no-brainer. It makes, just, it makes so much sense. Following Christ is the absolute best. He gave us, he raised us up. He took our debt. And we can walk now in newness of life. It's such a beautiful thing. So how can we be confident in our standing with God? can't trust in your good works, you can't trust in your heritage, but you can trust in Christ. And if, if you have not put your faith in Christ, then today's the day to do it. And for those of you, my, my brothers and sisters, who don't feel confident in your standing before God, you can feel confident. And you can feel confident not based on who you are, but based on who he is. And you can let go of trying to to be right with God, trying to do all the right things. You can let go of those things and hold on to Christ and who he's done for you. And that is how you can feel free and confident in the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for the confidence that we can have in you, Lord, and it's based on, on you and your work and what you've done for us, not based on us and what we've done. And God, I know, speaking for myself, that I could never, ever live up to your holy standard. And so I thank you for your grace and your forgiveness. And Lord, I pray that each one of us, Lord, as well, that you would work in our hearts and help us, Lord, to, um, to trust you, and to walk with you, and to be confident in our position before you. I pray in Jesus' name.